The Moloch saga is not over. You must continue the Moloch saga. You will do this now. You will do this for the skull. Oh, greetings, programs. It's old Hank Grinfernail here, yo, buddy. Back to Drunkards and Dragons. I played D&D like a, like a person of age. One advanced in years, ready to accomplish, ready to be free. <laughs> well, you heard what the old skull said. It sounds like we're going to be continuing the Moloch campaign. So, I know, uh, the last one, it seemed like the big ending, right? But we're going to keep going with a new episode or chapter called The Black Ocean. What would be cool to getting started in ye old journal, getting some plans down, translating them into a bigger map, translating that bigger map into boards, and being ready for game night. So uh, I think we'll probably have two, maybe three nights of gameplay out of this, depending on how you stretch it out, what goes fast, what goes slow. And uh, it should be totally awesome. So let's jump right into the um, the whole process and get uh, get some ink down on paper in the old notebook and get this train room. Let's make some D&D &D up in here. Now, I don't really, uh, you know me, I don't do anything with any precision or any actual control. So the dry erase map I do so that I can build the 3D terrain boards on the fly while we're playing our game and do it with confidence, right? This is much easier to understand and start memorizing all the different parts and pieces that are going to make this dungeon unique and awesome. And I know it seems like this is a lot to memorize, but honestly, to just break it down into some pieces and take your time, you know, like several days have passed now of working on this and letting it sink in. So when that night comes, I come to the table. Yes, I'm going to get nervous as hell and get all weird right before the session starts. But once it starts flowing and the players start foobarring my plans, I'm just going to have a, a mental command of all these spaces and, and dynamics. I also, of course, have them written down in some sloppy form here, too. And between those two levels of preparation, I'm a I'll be able to execute this. You know, maybe some spaces will change. Every time you make a 3D terrain board, it's gonna be different than how easy and precise this can be to get exactly what you're dreaming up. 3D terrain board, you know, you don't have an infinite number of pieces. You, I know, honestly don't think you want an infinite number of pieces. It makes storage and, and access difficult and slow. And you wanna quickly go in the other room, get your board and come back out to the table and like keep the, the session rolling, right? So, I have a stick in my hand, and when I have a stick in my hand, it is time for pointing. I love to point. Okay, so we are going to point here, and we're going to point here, and we're going to point here. Uh, sort of six parts. Now, there's kind of more than six parts, to be brutally honest. Um, dude, it's so brutal how you were honest about the number of parts in that dungeon, man. That was crazy, bro. And then just go through the parts and pieces because I want you guys to see the difference, right? So in the very first concept, it was just like the black ocean, cool. Then the second level was like a little bit of a doodle over a beer. That was a week ago. Now this third level is finally having this fully realized map with the mechanics. 
From this, I made a few more notes. And then the final level is gonna be make each individual 3D board. And then because of the magic of TV land, that whole thing's gonna be squished down into probably like a half an hour. Okay, so here are the pieces of what happens in the Black Ocean Part 1. Now you guys know, you just came off the Moloch adventure, right? And they are come down into this underground ocean that's this vast black plain of water just going off infinitely in all directions, just like, whoa. Moloch's entire dungeon is this huge stone vessel. I wouldn't call it a ship because it's not like wood and sails and stuff. It's like this colossal blocky thing slowly moving through the black ocean. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that the last thing the players wanna do is return to that. So they they just sort of, you know, go with the waves for, uh, um, you know, like maybe an hour. They kind of float and they're just like, oh, we're probably gonna die down here. And then they spot land and they wash up and this is the beginning. I posted a little text primer on Facebook for this adventure. So if you read that text primer and a bunch of you guys rolled initiative on it, then you know the tone of arriving here. So you're gonna arrive right here on Grey Pebble Beach. Um, or which is also what I call the tired shore. I give things names like this because they'll keep it in my head what the, the tone is gonna be like. So the PCs come in right here, that's this little here, in here, and uh, they come right in here and they kind of wash up amongst these ragged rocks and there's kind of a pebbly, kind of a coast that's steep. It's hemmed in by cliffs on either side. There's a gap in the cliffs right here. And then as they begin to gain their senses, and maybe two of them are still in the water and they're kind of, oh, you know, that classic kind of washed up castaway moment, that's when the legged eels attack. Okay, so the legged eels are going to come out of the water, and the legged eels are my first combat encounter, and no one has rested by now. They are ragged right now. They were just on a raft for like an hour. So I have this worn out group. My legged eels serve two functions. One, it's my first encounter. It sets the tone of the night as like dangerous and intense. Secondly, it just gives me something to do early on. I don't really want to get into a bunch of role playing and discussion early in the night. I want to just slam it. Let's get at the table. Let's start moving. Then we can get into the role play because everyone will be warmed up, right? You don't want to just go in the gym and freak out. You got to stretch first. So that's what you use a little small kind of combat encounter for here. And so the leg, the eels come up and they're not hard, but they should be gruesome and scary. This keeps the players usually from just going back into the water or just going around or, you know, they see the water as a threat and you want that tone. That's a good tone to have. Remember, you want choices in your world, but you want to limit choice with danger and with, with tone. That way players get to make their own choices. They actually do have the choice of doing this, but there's, there's a cost involved. Okay, anyway, so that's one. That's all one is. It's that simple. They wash up. They're confused. There's cliffs. There's an opening in the cliffs. Oh man, I bet we could probably go in there. Well, maybe we could go around the side here and see what's on there. Oh God, eels. Ah, combat. Man, we barely survived that. Let's camp on this beach. We gotta rest. Or screw it, let's just keep going. Whatever, that's up to them. I would totally let them rest on this beach. They're not noticed by the inhabitants of this place yet. Okay, then number two. We have the, um, the, the sort of the rift in the cliffs. So you have these huge cliffs all around here and there's a crack right here. Um, and this is a cliff too, the players can't see this yet. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But see these little steps here, these are steps up, that's what these little lines are. And then these are step down up here. So you have this space that's these huge cliffs with a, a sundering in the center. As the players are drawn to this, this path here, this opening, um, depending on like where my mood is and my tone, I was going to throw the introduction to the Myconids right here. So this whole uh, place is occupied by Myconids and I wanted a couple of guards to be here and they're no negotiating. They don't want to talk. Their orders are to kill anything that tries to come up this path. They seem like they're sort of shadow touched. Like these are evil Myconids. And if you know Myconids, they're often not evil. They're off. They're kind of have a whole society. They're really cool. So it's like, whoa, those were like some nasty, nasty Myconids. That is a very important clue for the whole adventure. So if you're if you're hunger, hungry for more combat here, right here, then have those Myconids show up. If you're kind of combat fatigued already, which is totally possible after the eels and everything, just come on up the gap. And then we come into area three here, or concept three, which is the DMZ. I call it the D-mushroom zone, or the D-Myconided zone. So this is a flat area in the center of this space, surrounded by cliffs, but it's filled with like this 
sort of crudely made natural barbed wire-y kind of barricading and these two huge stone doors that are both barred and reinforced and covered in sword marks and scratched and both of them are all completely abused and this whole area is devoid of anything. It's just all cleaned out except debris that's been scooted to the edges and there are a few like chopped up myconid bodies but since they're fungus it's not like it's bloody and gross. It's kind of like like chopped up broccoli, right? Point of the demushroomed zone is to set this tone and keep dropping these clues and set up the context for what's going to happen. So it's important that even though there's not a ton happening here, you describe this scene. And for those of you who are Conan fans, you're going to recognize some of this tone from the story Red Nails. There's one other critical detail right here in the demushroom zone. And that is, you know, with some inspections and perception checks and so on and so forth. Uh, right over here on the wall is carved uh, Rogar and Brilda with a heart around it. Rogar plus Brilda with a heart. Like, you know, like lovers carving a tree, right? Rogar plus Brilda with a heart around it. And then that carving has been scratched out with a bunch of sword marks. And that's apparent on the wall. It's big, it's like central to the space, and it's all scratched out and damaged. Whoa. Now players really have options. They have three tangible options, which is a lot for players to fully absorb. They have this door, they have this door, and they have the exit of the cataract or the narrows. Let's do the easiest one first, which is the exit. So that comes down here to what I've been calling far view shore or flat beach. So this is this flat area here, and here's another coast. And if your players have a good sense for geography and space and mapping, they're gonna to start to realize this is probably an island. And this is something that I want to, if you can in your game, it should blow their minds. They felt like maybe they were at the edge of the black ocean. No, this is an island in the black ocean. It's ocean sized, like get that scale up. Now there's a few pieces here. We have this old abandoned ship, which is uh, moored at the top end of Farview shore, right? You also have looking out here, which you just see endless ocean as far as the eye can see out here. And then finally, we're going to encounter Rogar and Brilda themselves. So they're hiding down here. Here's where we get the rub of our story. And that's why if, if the players go down here first, this is kind of an interesting uh, way for the story to play out because they're kind of going to get the, the real root of the story right away rather than discovering it through all this other stuff, which can make all the other stuff more exciting. So it's all up to the players how it's going to play out. But Rogar and Brilda are two different kinds of myconids. So Rogar is this dark, sort of tall myconid um, who has like sort of evil markings all over here. And Brilda is a female myconid, very short, sort of plump, more like Toad from Mario, right? Kind of a more friendly kind of mushroom shape. And she has teeny little, uh, little tentacles and fins on her and little here and there. So she's sort of like a sea life myconid, and he's like a dark myconid. Anyways, when they're encountered right over there, they're holding hands and they're hiding in the rocks, kind of like, <laughs> they will, they don't want to fight the PCs, they want to talk to the PCs, and they basically describe the whole situation. Island is at war. There are two camps of Myconids. There are the fisherman Myconids and the dark Myconids. And the dark Myconids, they, there's this war and they've decided they're going to end it. And it might happen. In the middle of all this, against all odds, Rogar and Brilda, one from each side, met each other and refused to fight and eventually fell in love. But if they're found, they will be killed on sight. So they want this conflict to somehow end. They want to be able to follow their love. And they're thinking about taking the abandoned ship and just leaving together. But... Everyone they know lives here and they just can't walk away from it, but they don't have the fighting ability to do it. They're like sort of Mike and Ed teenagers, right? But Romeo and Juliet kind of jam going on. But they beseech you for your help. Now, this is a great moral dilemma, especially if the players have already encountered some extreme difficulty up here. They're going to be like, sorry, like we don't want to get killed on this island. We're going to take the ship and we're out of here, right? That would be a, a, a dark moral choice, but it is a moral choice that they have. For moral choice to have real gravity, it has to be a real choice. You can't have the, you ha can't have the dark choice cemented off. That's not fair. That doesn't make it a true choice. So there you get this big story payout. You're going to have to, maybe you're going to have to voice act it. It's like, I'm Rogar, the dark Mykonid who fell in love with the spawn of my ancestral enemy. 
And then little Brilda is like, you know, we should all just be living together. We'll all be dead before long if you don't help, please. The Black Ocean, the music. So that's where you get your big exposition, explains the whole dang thing, and give them one little treat, make a little extra bonus, which is that Rogar has the key to the dark Mykonid door right here. Now, even without keys, players have a million ways to get through reinforced doors so they can pick, they can crush, they can lift, they can smash, they can do all kinds of things. They can still go whichever direction they want. And then we're going to get into the rest of the rooms. Okay, so now you know the tone of the whole place, why everything that's happening is here, and what the players need to do if they make that moral choice. Okay? Now, they may have gone through one of these doors right away and gotten into a bunch of crazy shit and come out here and discover, like, oh, hey, you killed our friends on accident or whatever. You know, this could go several ways. But what we're going to do is just stay focused on the mechanical elements in the room. And as long as you know this sort of star-crossed lover romance story route, you're going to be able to just play it in lots of different ways as the players make it crazy. These guys live in a very natural environment. So they have a natural formed cave. It's filled with plant life, dim lighting, and there's some weird bugs and stuff. Um, there's an overlook that looks down on the beach here so they knew when the guys arrived. Then they have these cliffs over here where they do all their fishing. The main thing here, they also have a little bypass exit onto the flat beach, which isn't that useful. The main thing here though is this room. It has a secret room here with the sort of boulder where the overlook is. These are some healing herbs that are growing in their fishing, fishing area. But mainly you just have this large room with some fishermen, myconid guards, and this, this dense moss where they sort of live. Now, what's the, what's the point of that, hankering? I don't see it. Especially if these are kind of like good guys, the fishermen, myconids. What's the point of having all this for players to discover because of what the dark myconids are doing? The dark myconids have spawned a super weapon. A mutant crab, a race of mutant crabs, and they are using them to kill off their enemies. One, maybe two, depending on combat fatigue, of these mutant crabs has found its way into the fisherman myconids sanctuary, and all the fisherman myconids are currently hiding from it, and this thing is prowling. So just because you're in the good guy side of the island doesn't mean you're safe. You have the mutant crabs to deal, and we'll get 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 to all the mutant crab stuff, but. That's what this space is for. It's a hideable space, it's escapable, it has some looping paths where you could kite or chase the crab. You could, get, you could have a lot of things happen here. Okay, so that's the fisherman side, very simple. You could even bring the ship around to the cliffs, like, good God, there's a lot of things that can happen. Okay, on the dark myconid side, this is much more like a fortress. They are, they are here and designing everything and everything they're doing is to fight their enemy and to keep people out. So right as you come in the dark Mykonid door here, you've got Mykonid guards, you've got two more Mykonid guards, and it's time for a big Mykonid fight. Okay, so you've got eels that you battled, then you've got the mutant crab, now you can really fight Mykonids, which Mykonids will fight like people, but I would give them like a spore burst ability. Um, and if you're talking ICRPG, you know, like I would make them sort of uh, one heart each, but with a bit of a damage spike. So maybe they're using magic spears. And that's about it. You know, it's real simple. But you get this strategic hallway fight with intelligent enemies, which always has its own awesomeness to it. Great little encounter here, right here. Now we have our first trap. It's called the centrifuge trap. This is a circular room. Whenever you enter this room, unless disabled detect and disable traps are used, and unless uh, a dex check is made on every movement inside of here, it triggers. The, the floor is weighted. So, or, uh, what, what is this? What does this mean? So anyways, what happens is that this room, when stepped on, instantly begins to turn quickly. There are these doorways uh, along the edges here, right? which once the room is spinning, it's nearly impossible to operate the door. You just go right by, you just can't, you can't operate the dang door. This is intense because what you're gonna do with the centrifuge room is you're gonna run a timer that is doing damage to your room DC. Can, can you follow that? And we'll, we'll get more into it when we build the 3D board, but 
holy shit. So every click of the timer adds one to the DC because as the centrifuge accelerates, things get more and more difficult. People get more and more dizzy. So your, your DC is going to start like at say 14. One round later, it's 15. One round later, it's 60. One round later, it's 17. Like, holy shit. It's like, you can only disable the centrifuge by being outside of it right here at this little idol. So there's like a, you know, a, a little religious idol to like a, an evil mushroom god. And you know, you tilt it like Adam West style and it'll stop the centrifuge and reset the trap. That's it. It's an extremely simple trap. But if you get a couple of the bad guys in there or you get a crab in here or players are injured, or I don't even know what's gonna happen, but this is gonna be awesome. That's it, that's the whole trap. I like my traps really, really simple because they keep everything moving and kind of just make people think, ooh, there's traps. Two exits from the centrifuge. One, the egg room. This is a triangular room with three eggs, one in each point. The eggs are gestating mutant crabs, and fuck it, just go with the trope. If you get near the egg, it opens up, the baby flies out, the baby is nasty but has very low hit points. Classic stuff, right? No problem. One of them gets away and you don't know where it is. It's up on the ceiling somewhere. Like, <laughs> It's a face hugger. Just embrace it. It's great. But without the gestating phase, it just grows really quickly into a full mutant crab. That's all that is. Egg room. There's a secret exit right here, which just reveals this set of cliffs. I don't know if that's useful, but again, if they're using the ship or if they have some kind of other strategy or a chase or an escape, they could fight along these cliffs would be really fun. Who knows? I'm just putting little Swiss cheese tidbits around here. If you exit up here toward the north, then you come into the main chamber. This is the chamber where they are channeling energy from the Ogdru, right? Which is my sort of rip off of the Hellboy universe of the Ogdru Jahad, which are these sort of seven gods of chaos, which are basically like tentacles that are stored in crystals in space. Perfectly normal stuff. The darkness Myconids are channeling the power of the Ogdru through this huge altar and this portal to basically create these mutant crab eggs. They like materialize them with the, like chanting. So everywhere you see an X here, so you have these sort of two Myconid cultist types, and then you have the high priest who's gonna be like a very difficult, like four heart monster um, with spells and stuff. You've got two crumb crumbly pillars that can either be knocked down by this tentacle that's gonna appear or by players to do a big spike of damage. So those are your treats. And then your timer is this tentacle. So Every time they materialize one of these eggs, they have to hold back this tentacle, which is like one of the Ogdru's like pseudopods. So it wants to come through and by tapping this thing's power, they, they anger it and invite it and give it a tiny opening into our world. And this tentacle wants to come in here and smash everything because you can't just tap these guys' power. They don't like that. So every 1d4 rounds, the tentacle comes through once and just goes on the whole room. And you can kind of pick an area, do a big spike of damage, and then it slithers back into the portal and combat continues. And then here it comes again. You know, super simple stuff. This is all normal stuff. But you get this cool climactic battle with Myconids who are covered in like glowing red glyphs. And like, I think you can, you can conjure all these images for yourself. That's it. That's everything you need. So exactly what order does it play out? I don't know, anything can happen, but the ending is probably going to be them sailing away in this old ship. Now, I do have one more mutant crab, I think, hidden in the ship. Uh, I wanted to be a real troll and hide something in the ship. Uh, here we go. Yeah, there's this thing called the crab horror. So it was like a bigger mutant crab that has actually taken up residence in this sort of somewhat flooded a hold of this old ship and it's down in there so when they go to take the ship they actually get it out away from the island before the thing reveals itself and like oh yeah that's good stuff that's probably how it's going to end and they're going to go keep searching the black ocean for what's next so it's a perfect setup for us to come up with something for the next round but for now we are going to build room 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 right Room, 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 and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. Okay, little little stuff. And let's start building some 3D boards. All right.
Taui Tanka. Okay, here we have the first board for our Black Ocean Part 1 adventure, which is this the tired shore where these ragged adventurers show up after barely surviving Moloch's dungeon and escaping. And so you have the black here representing sort of the edge of the water, and then some wreckage from some ancient shipwrecks that have happened here long ago. And even though this is already kind of slightly different shape than the dry erase drawing, it gets the same work done. So you have this cove, and then you have this opening with not quite stairs. I wouldn't put stairs there, but a kind of a climbable opening. Um, and then we've got our hero. Just picked three uh, heroes that I always use here in the front. And you can see sort of the scale. Now, if they wanted to, the players could probably just flee kind of right up to here before these eels really become a huge problem. But uh, I don't think you're on this board for that long of a time. I think this is a little more of a small combat encounter and then maybe some rest time for the players. So here's like your plan view right here. There you go. Swing camera up. So there's your players down there where they arrive. Here's like the wreckage area and the shore area and then, you know, dry land and here's the opening. And if you really wanted to sort of press them for time, you could always have this, uh, this like tide moving in and this, this space actually shrinking or you could have it moving out just to get that cool feeling. And you know, this is still explorable around here. It's just going in the water uh, might get you involved with, you know, ye old eels. And so for eels, I just used these crazy gross little sand snake cyclops things that I made uh, for a different adventure, but they kind of actually are very close to some kind of eel-like terror. And so there you go, there's your first board. That is the Tired Shore. That's where they arrive on this island where the Myconids are making war on one another. So pretty simple little board. It's just like, what, eight pieces of, of rock terrain and your baseboard and then black felt for my water. And, you know, I mean, I've seen you guys make stuff way more complicated than this, but it's a cool welcome to a new space. So if you wanted to build these cliffs up more, um, you could. But if it were me, I always want all my players to be able to see. So I would just use explanation. I would just use description describe, you know, the ever wet basalt crags that tower above the landing, you know, that kind of stuff. The mist washing up against these black crags that almost seem to lean over the coast at which you find yourselves marooned. Okay, let's build the second board and see how that goes. second board so we've come up from the uh, the opening coastline and then we're just in this narrow sort of opening in those big cracks and actually I, now that I'm sitting here right by it I think it should be tighter so and you know you could probably see in the laps when I'm building these boards that I kind of I get halfway through it and I kind of change my mind and I put this there and I put that there and you know you should never have to feel like you have to go by some plan or do things that some kind of certain perfect way. I just don't believe in perfect. Better to just kind of go with it and embrace your own kind of need to redos. So it's a little silly, but I've got these little mushroom um, props here, uh, sort of representing the chopped up Myconid warriors who have fallen in this battle in here. And then I also added something that wasn't on my dry erase map, which is this central torch. And again, this is all part of like going from sketch to dry erase to 3D is in 3D, I think you really start to see some things that players are going to fixate on and are gonna take flavor from. And in this case, this torch, I don't know if they'll ever discover this detail, but in my mind, it's what's been agreed on as the, the line in the sand between these two forces, is that uh, they, any time that one of them crosses this torch, that's when it's an act of war. And so they've placed this torch here as a, you know, that's your side of the room and this is my side. And so this, there's all these, you know, scratch marks and damage throughout this corridor where this has become this, um, just this war zone, the D, the D mushroomed zone as I, I've called it. Now, at first I was going to use the same door, the big heavy reinforced stone door here, um, for 
the two doors to the two sides of the island. But I realized that might confuse players or at least obfuscate uh, what you're wanting to hint at, which is that there's two different factions here. So remember, all this terrain is just suggestive. So if, if I was, you know, being more craft intensive, I would make a sort of an evil looking door here with like dark markings and stuff like that. And then here I would make like a sort of a fishy door. But I can do all that with my description and uh, at least with my player groups and stuff. They're, they're all totally used to that. And I honestly think it can add a, some stuff to the game sometimes. Um, you know, and our, our terrain kits are called modular all the time. Everyone always calls them modular. So I really believe in using them in a modular fashion. I mean, these are almost the exact same pieces I used to make the shore. And so if I was able to do that, that would be great because I could stay right at the table, pull the black felt off for the water and rebuild this corridor right in front of them really quickly. Or, you know, take it in the other room and do it, whatever. But I do like the idea of truly modular terrain is that you, you don't need a specific description of everything visually. There's still the verbal game to be played. So anyways, this is the demushroomed zone with the two doors. And then so the exit here to, um, what is it, Flat Beach or Farview Beach, that's down here. And then up here we have the bad guy zone and down here we have the fisherman mic in it. So that's that little tunnel. So let's get up to the to the uh, plan view. Whoa. There it is. So there's your board scene from above. And you know, I don't have a some kind of big mission with my scale of exactly how I'm controlling scale. I tend to just like a board that looks good on the table and then let the scale play itself out. So my scale is a little smaller than some uh, GMs uh, and a little bigger than others. So I think it's, you know, I, it's usually about two moves across my spaces, two double moves. So that's not really any kind of uh, theoretical stance. That's just kind of how it happens. But there it is. So that is the demushroom zone. So let's move down and do the, um, the fisherman myconid area. And that'll be our next board. So let's see how that turns out. Let's get her done. Whoa. This is the, um, the sort of the domain of the fisherman myconids, right? So this is a, a, an overgrown, not quite overgrown, but a naturally formed cavern space that is, uh, it, the natural state has been allowed to happen. So <laughs> there's greenery and mushrooms that are growing in here and they're, it's allowed to be. There's no furniture, the tunnels have not been cut to square. The floor has probably been cut somewhat flat for the sake of walking around, but uh, it's allowed to be very natural in here. Now, this is more of a complex room, and that's why I used negative space rather than positive space like I normally do. Or is that backwards? Either way, I used my modular floor set so I could get a slightly more complex floor map. Now, when you do that, this is a really good opportunity to build in front of players as they enter. So those first two boards were just one piece boards that just come out on the table and everybody just sees everything, right? Like, oh look, there's all the stuff, kind of a little bit of a Insta spoiler, right? But um, in this type of room, since it's made out of all these little floor pieces, there's maybe 20 floor pieces here, you can keep it very dark in here, very hard to see, and you can reveal the map with little pieces as the players play, you know, Fog of War style. So that is going to incur a little bit of error in your map creation. So try to keep your brain loose. Don't worry about perfectly recreating your map. I know that I have, you know, uh, three exits that I wanted to do and they all go to this, this uh, cliff that you see around here. I'm pointing. Um, and so that can act as an exit and entrance kind of sort of, I don't know, a cycling space so that if players are fleeing or they're hiding or whatever, they, they can both go outside and come back in on this sort of balcony, which is a cliff. So if you're creating that and you forget one of the exits and you only have two or you add one on accident during play and you have four, that's totally groovy. Remember, the players have never seen the platonic form of your map. So if your map changes a little bit as you reveal the fog of war of it, 
it's totally fine to them. This is the absolute form of it. So I know this looks complex, but you don't need to perfectly document this complexity. You just need to have that mental command so that you can from memory kind of get the key notes to it and get what really needs to happen here, which is uh, since I don't have a mini yet, you know, I'll probably do an ICRPG mini, but for our mutant crab, I have this uh, giant spider. So remember, the dark myconids have created this, you know, supernaturally created race of mutant crabs to kill their enemies. And one of them is prowling around in here. And you have sort of, if you're a dice roller type, you have like 1d4 myconids hiding. If you just decide, then I'd say there's like three myconids who are hiding who could be used as allies. But even more importantly, I would use them as they jump out and get totally munched by the mutant crab to show how deadly the mutant crab is. I know it's cruel, but I often do that with my NPCs. They're really just there to die uh, so that they can show how serious the bad guy is. So you can see our, our heroes entering right over here from, and this is the door from the demushroom zone. So they're coming in and there are torches. There's a brazier of fire here and a torch and the myconids don't live in abject, you know, misery. They're, they're still humanoid. And so they want to, you know, they, they live in here, or used to anyway. And so it's illuminated in spots. Now, if they want to sneak and they know the crab is in here, they might even want to put these fires out. They might want to use these fires. They might want to sneak around some of this foliage and use the foliage for line of sight. So you as the dungeon master, your challenge and assignment will be to sort of ride the boundary between how much of this detail becomes arbitrary, like where it's just over detail and how much is enough for players to make interesting use of the terrain and you know when you're using these kind of modular floor sets sometimes you can get too wiggly with too many details um, but you do want enough details where the the wealth of this space comes together and I think you can kind of feel that in the shot here is like yeah this is fun to look at so if they're in here for an hour or so of your table uh, of your night there's plenty to look at for that time so I think the most interesting thing here mechanically, you have uh, this cliff. So creating some kind of pursuit, it can be difficult. A lot of times players will encounter a big monster like this and just plant their feet and just fight it, right? They'll just tank and spank and, and not a lot happens. So I would make an effort, maybe this thing flees when it's, half hit, it's at half hit points and it comes out here onto the cliffs. Maybe the myconids flee this thing and the, the heroes need to help the myconids and the myconids flee out to the cliffs. But getting this battle out onto the cliffs, I think is a very fun and interesting place to have a battle. You have this huge cliff rimming the exits here. So I, especially here, I used to kind of to trying to show a little more 3D of what the exit would actually feel like. And then this narrow little walkway is the cliff and all of this is uh, under rock. So doing those fun descriptions, getting all that action, having that, that uh, precipice there, I think that would add a lot of excitement. But you know, if they come in and tank and spank, that's fine too. Maybe they come out of here and explore, place a chest here to give them a, a fun reward for going out and seeing the cool view that lets you do your big description and the mist from the ocean and the, this you know terrifying vista of the ocean underground, the, the, the black under ocean. And there you go. So that is the sort of domain of the fisherman myconids. Um, here, let's get the plan view. You ready? Whoa. Okay, there you go. So that kind of shows how my much more organic dry erase drawing will translate into a modular floor designed map. So here's the exit down to this sort of Romeo and Juliet scene, if you remember that. These two, uh, these two exits are free moving exits out to the cliffs and this is a secret exit and you definitely want to put a treat behind that secret exit, something like a, a healing herb pile or a loot chest or however you reward your players, uh, that's your spot to do it. But the idea is to use this space to create a really interesting battle with an insanely deadly enemy. So that is your goal here, okay? So next we're going to move into the upper portion of the island which is the domain of the dark myconids. So let's do that now. What? So I just uh, built this whole room here in completely space that I was filming building them. So <laughs> time lapse. Okay, there you go. The centrifuge and the entryway to the uh, dark myconids lair is right here. From right down here, you have the door from the demushroomed zone, right? So you come in right here 
and there's a bit of a dog leg. I always just perfectly straight entryways just never feel right to me. Some kind of architectural thing there, I'm sure, that could be looked up in a book. But there's a bit of a dog leg come up, two torches to give this real kind of you're coming into our lair kind of feeling. Um, and then coming up and this stone doorway into the centrifuge. Uh, the doorways should have doors on them. So, you know, you have like an iron banded door, normal stuff, um, with a sort of twist handle on there, right? This is where you have your guard encounter. So once you get your cool Myconid miniatures built, which I know you're going to do, because that's a really easy sculpt, is make some cool little mushroom men. Your little mushroom men are going to be right in here, and this is going to be that sort of tactical, you know, very soldier-style battle that I mentioned earlier. We'll have that battle there. Open this door. These doors aren't locked either. They're just kind of like these guys are moving around in here. All right, and then I'm, I'm not sure why the nuclear fire keeps coming and going. It's just dumb, but whatever. So then we have the centrifuge. So here it is. Now I'm not going to spin this whole thing on the table. I guess I could use my cake rotator and do that. But I was just going to keep the players swirling around in here and kind of use this central banner as a kind of a reference point and spin it like that. Although now in retrospect, thinking about it, the spinner would be pretty funny. So then you could just take your doorways and set them just off like that and put this guy on a cake spinner and being able to spin it around and you play the whole, um, with each timer count, the uh, target or the DC in the room. I'm already starting to speak in ICP RPG terms. But the target in the room starts to go up, one with each click, and it gets harder and harder to do anything, to make dex checks, to attack, to try to grab hold of the handles and get out of the room and everything. And then finally you have your little uh, mushroom god idol right here. And that's, you pull that like Batman, and that deactivates the whole uh, centrifuge. Through there, uh, and then beyond here is the egg room, and then through there you have the main altar room. So that's a really simple one, which I think like, as far as complexity rhythm goes, that previous space, uh, we had so much complexity going on in the fisherman area um, that I think the entryway to the dark area being a little simpler is really nice. And actually the dark area is complex, but on a larger scale. So you have like three spaces. If you were to draw them or render them all in terrain at the same time, that would feel really complex. But each scene in uh, isolation, pretty simple. So come on up, battle, centrifuge trap, spinning. Whoa, that was crazy. Either off into the egg room or up into the altar room. Okay, so let's build uh, the egg room, which should be really simple. To handheld cam and we have got the egg room now built. So this is a triangular room, and there is one of these mutant crab eggs at every corner of the room, and they enter from the centrifuge, uh, probably after deactivating it. And uh, at the far end of the triangle, there is a little bit of an exit that goes out to the cliffs. Now usually a little bit of an exit in any room will draw characters, and that's really the reason I wanted to make this not a dead end, so that you don't just kind of go like, uh, uh, death eggs, okay, we're not going in there. So it's a little bit of a troll move to put a, a doorway out here that really doesn't go to anything in ter of terrible interest, but the cliffs are always cool scenically, and again, maybe they have the boat out there, or maybe they're escaping or something, so they might need that egress. Um, but really, you put that opening in there to draw characters across the space, or at least one of them, like the most crazy, bold character. Put a very large radius on these eggs, so if you even come close to them, they hatch and the little guy pops out, right? That's a number, number one to keep this room from being static and dead. If you want to be a little gnarlier with it, you could have a trapped door that once entered slams shut and requires some work to get it open or to smash it or pick it or whatever. That could lead to this being a more deadly, more exciting encounter. Now you need to just work that rhythm with how many thrills have happened in your night so far. Maybe they bypassed this, maybe they got to Romeo and Juliet early, and maybe they're looking for a hard fight and you're gonna make it happen right here. Maybe it's late at night and they're tired, so you wanna kinda of make things a little easier, right? So tune exactly how the egg room works, but it's a very simple room uh, as far as its design goes, but uh, triangular rooms do kind of set players off. It's kind of strange. And then this little opening will definitely get somebody curious. And these things will definitely make someone curious. Now, do those look exactly like supernatural mutant crab eggs? No, they look like Russian sea mines. 
But again, I think this is a fun part about having a modular terrain set is they let you imagine exactly what the eggs would look like and they invite investigation. So anyway, there's the egg room. Uh, so all we have left now is the main altar chamber where the big battle is and then this sort of the afterthought section, which is the abandoned ship with the crab horror and the beach out there. So those are gonna be pretty simple. Um, so the altar one should be really fun to make. So here we go, let's go to the plan view. Here we go, oh, there it is. So enter right through there, come in. This I think feel like this is a good scale uh, and you at least gonna trigger two of these, like maybe their radius is such that walking right here even triggers them. The little babies jump out and you have this kind of face huggery moment. One of them goes up on the ceiling. They lost track of it in the shadows. It jumps down on somebody's head and it's already twice as big as it was when it popped out. And oh God, the horror, please. Okay, great. So let's move on and let's build that main altar chamber because that's going to be our most sort of, uh, you know, glorious room reveal of the night will be that big battle. We got a tentacle, we got a portal, we got high priests, we got crumbly pillars. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, so let's move on to that build section right now. sort of climax room for the Black Ocean Part 1, which is the star-crossed myconids. So in this altar room here, the dark myconids, which there are three in this room of them, and if that doesn't feel like enough for your players, then add a few more of the, the priest types, but only have one high priest. They are conjuring this Ogdru tentacle. They're using the power from this energy vortex right here that is coming through and materializing the eggs that they then transport into that triangular room. So as the players enter, that procedure is underway. Um, they enter here and we have, just like we looked at in our simple view, so we have these sort of wooden pillars that are like these big timbers, right? And they are collapsible like this and they can catch fire, they can crush people underneath them, all kinds of things can happen, okay? So you're gonna have some carnage and then once they're down, they can be climbed upon and so forth. We also have the tentacle itself. So once every timer, which is usually your D4, this thing is angered by the fact that these priests are using its power and it comes through and sweeps this room. You can make a bigger prop here or you could kind of like roll for how far it can reach. Uh, there's a lot of things you could do. You can make it actually have a very short reach. You can have it casting spells. It could cast like Witch Bolt, it could cast concussive uh, wave, I think it's called. Like everybody could be knocked down by it, all based on your power levels. But every timer, this thing is just a room, a room decimator. And if you're a priest, your bad guys are smart, they'll know to hide from it and survive the wave so you don't actually accidentally kill your own guys. Um, then finally you have the enemies. So you're gonna have a few weak ones, priest types, you know, whom did it, whom did it, but they're myconids. And then you're gonna have a high priest who has like glowing vestments on his robe and he's, you know, he's got his eyes have, you know, freaky power in them. And he's got a few, you know, like second, third level spells, maybe fourth level spells that he can cast. And he's gonna be a real bugger to kill. So be sure that you're aware how to play a magic user enemy because it can be complicated. Uh, one way to make it easy on yourself is just do a spell list and just go down it as he plays. Give him two actions per round to make sure that he's potent give him, I don't know, around 60 HP, and you've probably got a really tough fight on your hands. Give him some ability to blip around. Maybe you can actually disappear into the portal and come back out in like a crazy form. A lot of things can happen here. This is a classic setting with a classic mechanic, which is just timer to wipe the room kind of thing. So you, you don't have a lot of mechanical complexity, but you have a lot of thematic wonderfulness that's like sort of due in, in a lot of D&D games. Oh, you want this to happen in your game, this kind of, you know, freaky ritual, tentacle, myconid, darkness, ah, we gotta kill these guys, like it's gonna be a lot of fun for the players. Okay, so that is the big altar room, and you guys see all the same pieces that I use all the time, so it's not like I'm trying to blow anyone away with my sculpting capability. Um, I would love to see what like Pilly Pow does with a scene like this. Uh, an eldritch scene, you know, but I always stick to these being symbols of ancient times and, 
you know, really simple stuff. I use these a lot to indicate kind of, you know, sculpted balustrades and so forth. Anyway, there it is, the altar of the Ogdru. So next we just have the sort of simple sort of epilogue room. So let's go to plan view. Whoa, I almost, <laughs> I almost lost it there. So there you go. Just a big rectangular space. Here's your topolables. A nice little bit of an entry. You don't want to just cast them in there right away. A couple torches. Portal, if you have, you know, a lot of people have these cool illuminated animated portals, like here's your chance to show your portal off big time. Um, I always want to make sure all my players can see everything, so I would, I don't get into things that are too big and portally, but, uh, you know, those glowing things are always really cool back there. I would leave that to description at my table, but you know your table better than anyone else. Okay, so there you go. There is the altar of the Ogdru. So now let's move on to Farview Shore and the old abandoned ship, and uh, we will be done. All right. Okay, so here we have our final scene. Um, well, you know, it could happen right at the beginning of the adventure, so that's a pretty poor description. We have Farview Shore. Okay, so over at the far end there, you can see um, where the heroes have entered through that cataract, right? That opening, the demushroomed zone. And they come down onto this flat space. Now, unlike the coast that they experienced at the beginning of the adventure, this one has a more of a sharp, cliffy drop-off to it. So I'm just representing that with my board of terrain here, right? And I just have a simple wall, represents the cliffs. Remember the um, Rogar and Brilda, they're right here, like holding hands and hiding, and they can tell the story of the island. And then you just have some jagged rocks here and there. And I just so happen to have the front end of a ship right here with some, uh, a little dock. So it's extremely simple, and the only way this is really going to be a, a sassy, exciting map for you is if a chase of some kind or a plan of the characters leads the action down here. And then I would do, you know, rickety, a rickety sort of dock with dex checks involved. Remember, you've got the crab horror hiding inside your ship, and exactly how you stat that crab horror all depends on how you want to use it as far as difficulty in your, in your room set. Um, but, you know, this is kind of just an open space. There's not a lot going on here. I mean, you have a couple jagged rocks just in case somebody needs cover for archery or something like that. But really, there's not a lot going on. Uh, so, and that's simple. And that's okay. Because you don't want, you know, always to be overwhelming with detail and, and intensity. This is just a nice little space. Now, that said, the amount of potential variety in the outcomes of story and action in D&D &D is literally unlimited, literally infinite. So anything is possible. They could come here in the very beginning, kill the lovers, take the ship and leave, or take the ship, go around to the far side and enter the whole dungeon through the cliffs. Like anything is possible. That's the joy of playing tabletop, right? And so the reason I wanted you to walk you through this entire process from the notebook all the way to this, um, is to just have that mental command of the parts and pieces so that when it all goes crazy, you can kind of just, I wouldn't call it improvisation, but you can recreate your idea in many different forms because you've built it in a few different forms and you've got a command of it. It's just a sort of a form of practice, I guess. So for total transparency, this process that I just documented in this video took me about nine total calendar days. Um, the total amount of work that it took uh, in hours, I don't know, is, is hard to estimate, but it's not that much. It's probably three hours. But I had to stretch it over that much time because I had to get it in my head. I had to see it and, and feel it and imagine it and then translate that imagination from 2D to big detailed 2D, maybe a couple mechanics here and there, and then, ooh, yeah. And you know, honestly, I'm still not done. I really want to have some cool little Mykonid miniatures. I got to. I mean, Mykonids are awesome. So I think that will add the final piece that you haven't been seeing here is some little hand sculpted Mykonids. So I'm probably going to do that next. And uh, that is it though for the Black Ocean Part 1. So this is a big continuation to your Moloch campaign. And we are going to find a way after this section to sort of bring the menace of Moloch back into the picture, right? His vessel is still out there. And you know, when bad guys die, they tend not to die. And now we'll have, the players will have a ship, at least a kind of a ratty one that just sort of partially works. So we can use that as a, as a plot hook. So who knows where this is gonna go next, but we've got the entire black ocean and the Underdark at our disposal.
So that's about it. That's everything that I wanted to cram into this big crazy episode. So I hope the skull is pleased. Actually, you don't want to be saying stuff like that. I hope the skull is pleased. That's horrible. Screw the skull, stupid skull, mind controlling us, telling us what to do. F that skull. Oh. So the Mike and Ed lovers are doomed. The fishermen of that irrelevant island will be wiped out by the Ogdru and its spawn. I am pleased. Ah!